Welcome back to part two of how to handle thin wall material, flexible material. I want to thank everybody that took the time to comment on part one and identify exactly what that shape was called. Now, believe it or not, that shape, although I did not know what it was called, and that's to be truthful, it was done intentionally to support this particular part two of the video. Now, this is the raw material that it came out of. PVC pipe. Very flexible. I could probably distort this 10, 15 thou by hand and much more in the machine, of course. But a lot of people have said, well, if you want to do that, turn a plug and jam a plug down inside of that and then squeeze it. Yes and no. If you stick a plug down inside of this part and this part isn't already round, when you stick that plug inside, you are going to force this pipe to be round. So what you've done is instead of putting a negative distortion into this part, you've put a positive distortion into this part. You have forced this to be round prior to machining it. And when you knock the plug out, it is going to go back to its normal shape. Yes. Not 100% because as the part gets farther from the grip of the chuck extended out, the distortion will be less out here only because of the strength of the material. So it's a conical distortion. That being said, a conical distortion is only gripping right in the front of the jaw and can pull out easily. So be very careful with the amount of tension that you put on these or any part that you know is thin. How I would do this, and unless you want to have a stack of plugs alongside of your machine that you consistently alter, Here's your solution. Ta da! A jaw spider. Stick it in there. This is the same spider that I use to bore my soft jaws. When it just lightly drags, you are good to go. Make sure that your jaw contact is in this area right here. And it doesn't matter if this is egg shaped, oval round, out around, whatever. When you do this, and this is in line with the jaw, the chances of distorting this part are somewhat reduced. I'm not going to say it's eliminated because everything has its point of yield, of course. On the tops of these screws, I have about a 10 degree, maybe less chamfer on the tops of these, so it will ride true inside pipe. When the pipe is bigger and it allows for it, I will use a shim between the screw head and the inside of the pipe, but that's for much larger applications. So a jaw spider is a really good idea. It saves you from turning 99 different plugs and works regardless how bad the part is. Let's see if we can stick that in there. Now a jaw spider like this, I would suggest you only use, not for second op like this, but for initial operations where you're going to create this part. Make sure that the master does not distort. All right, I'm not going to beat this subject to death, but there you go. Jaw spider is probably better than a plug. A plug will make your wonky part round, then it's going to return after you machine it. Three points of contact, never going to be a problem. All right, let's throw this back in the machine. Find those high spots and cut them down. And the way I'm going to do that I'm going to sandwich it. I'm going to hold it this way. If you have a delicate feature and you know pressure is going to influence that feature, stay away from it. Do this way. Okay? Sandwich it. Same thing with an extrusion in a mill vise if it's thin and it's going to crush when you squeeze it. If you can, turn it sideways. If you can't turn it sideways, well maybe bolt something to it and hold on to that. Let's set it up, cut it, make it round. This current setup is strictly a sandwich operation. There is no locating diameter on the major driving plate back here on the sacrificial pressure receiver because the wooden part right here is doing all the pushing. There's no turn diameter on that so the risk of no location diameter is that the part can slip out of concentricity. That is a risk. With a plastic part like this if you apply too much end pressure you could force a bulge in the center which translates to a low spot after the turning operation. So get a feel for how much pressure you can put on the part that you're working on. You can see the needle. 
that's about plus one and a half, minus a half, zero. So we're within a thou concentricity, two thousandths total indicator reading. I'm going to call this a day because without a locating diameter on the inside of the part, on this face right here, you could be here all day. Do not tap the part. Allow the part to move under gravity. If you tap it, you will influence how round it is. Let's put a tool to that, take the high spots out, and for those of you that didn't or won't stick around for how round this isn't, let's find the low spot and max the needle out. This is a 30 thou uh, stroke indicator. Actually, we don't even need to max it out. You can see how bad it is just by looking at it. I hope that against my black shirt you can see how far out that is. Let's find a low spot because there's a bunch of them. Three to be exact. Get it to read just barely. There we go. Thirty-five and it maxes out the indicator. So it showed up as two and a half on the surface plate. When pivoting around a center, this is what you get. See if I could turn this without having it fly out and hit me in the face. That wouldn't be a whole lot of fun. 770 RPM, high speed steel tool. And I'm going to baby this because I don't want it to move. And I think for sake of illustration, I'm going to track a red line around the OD of this part so you can see the cleanup. Uh, additionally, as the chips are coming off, if they're not making a string and they're making all these little curly cues that you can see pretty much everywhere, you know that it's an interrupted cut. So as soon as it starts making string, you've got a clean diameter. I do not expect this part to be truly round when I'm done because of the material stress. It will continue to move as you cut it, but it's going to be a whole lot closer than it was. Let's do it. Okay, you can see that the parts that are coming off, the high spots that are coming off, are in line with the jaws. That's a coincidence, but I'm really glad it did that. It illustrates clearly that it's 120 degrees worth of uh, distortion. Let's keep going. The chips are getting longer, which indicates that the cut is getting deeper. That's a good thing. And it is a very symmetrical remnant that is left behind with the Sharpie, so you can tell that what you have is exactly what you want to see. If one of these was shorter than the other two, you know that the part was loaded incorrectly or has shifted during the process.
Okay, I would say we are right there. One more pass ought to do it. Okay, let's put it between some rollers and see what we get. Before we get on the surface plate, let's take a look at where those little red marks are. And you can see that we have reversed the problem. The red marks are now cut away. It was the apex of our triangle, and we took the top off. So the fact that we see thin, fat, and thin would indicate pretty clearly that we have a round outside and a severely distorted inside considerably. Now when you relieve the pressure, when you relieve the sandwich pressure on a part like this, listen for it to click. If it's clicking, that means it's probably relaxing into a shape that wasn't 100% what you thought you were going to get. If at all possible during the process, relieve some of that pressure and reapply. If the part is going to move, let it relax. Let's check it. Just for a fair comparison post machining, we're going to inspect it first of all the same way I did it before. We're going to roll it under this needle and watch where the needle goes. Zero at the red. Come on, give me a zero. I have not checked. This is the first time we're going to see it together. Three under. There's that relaxation I was talking about. One under. Let's go between. Two, zero, plus one. So we're about two on either side of center at this point. All right, fair enough. Now for everybody that does not have a giant V block, you're gonna like this trick. And to be honest with you, personally, I do have aluminum V blocks that I use for tooling purposes, but I don't have a large V block. All my work is very small. Two, one, two, three blocks in a grinding vise. Squeeze it, it's going to give us the three points of contact that I'm looking for. Let's check it again. This is for all you metrology geniuses out there that suggested this in video number one. And this is a correct way to do it. If you can't sit it down and tram it with a CMM or a white light uh, scanner of some sort, you should absolutely do it this way or between a set of roller V-blocks. I know you can find that online as well. Give me a check in to... Uh, Realign this, we'll get back to you. Okay, the test. I'm going to put a little bit of pressure inside the ring down here. Just a little bit of finger pressure and watch how the needle bounces. Watch how delicate this part is. Considerable. Zero this out within reason and let's spin the part. something on here to indicate where we're starting so you know it come around full circle a little X on the part we're gonna see this together I have not done this off camera and whatever the results are that's what they're gonna stay I will not change this Zero that based on what we're seeing. Okay, well, that's what we got. We got about five thou out around five thou total, but actually, not bad at all considering. 
Use the sandwich technique when you turn delicate material. Use a spider on the inside when you create your initial blank. And I believe that the stress on this part is so out of sync right now because of the eccentricity of the inside that as we cut this away, it's just going to continue to move. Sometimes it's an uphill battle. Sometimes you win. That's how I do it. And that's how I will continue to do it. And if you haven't tried it, try it. You're going to like that sandwich method. It works very well. And uh, also try it with a boss on your arbor to reduce setup time. That's all I got, guys. Thanks for watching. Stay well.